Um, honorable guests, distinguished uh, members um, of the Afghan diaspora community, members of um, academia, distinguished uh, scholars, um, uh, welcome to the Embassy of Afghanistan. Uh, our today's event is slightly different than the events that we normally hold at the Embassy. Uh, it's an event that we hope to be the beginning of a very important discourse um, that we hopefully we hope that will be followed by um, our uh, scholars and researchers with additional work in the future, and it's about the preservation of the Afghan culture on the academic front. That we think that besides the damage that has happened to the culture of Afghanistan physically. There is a damage that is continuously happening on the academic front to the Afghan culture by a significant part of the culture being attributed um, wrongly to other regions of the um, uh, world or to other countries of the same uh, region. So we hope that this uh, will be a beginning of that discourse. Our agenda um, will have three elements. Of course, the main agenda is the presentation by Mr. Hamid Marid. But before uh, that, uh, we'll have a short welcoming remark by our Charge Affairs, Ms. Mahina Fatimi, and then uh, Ms. Bakri remarks by uh, Mr. Hassan uh, Shirzel, uh, the director of the Afghan Academy, and then the presentation by uh, our scholar. So I'd like to call upon Ms. Madina Qasimi uh, to deliver her remarks. Respected guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the Embassy of Afghanistan. We are very delighted to host this important event at the Embassy. First of all, let me congratulate to our well-known author, historian, artist, Mr. Hamid Nawid for his uh, completion of his recent book on the history of art in Afghanistan. His work is valuable. Mr. Nawid, you did a great job and it happened in a right time because government of Afghanistan and our key ally, the United States of America, or work in different front to restore the cultural heritage in Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, our history inspires our unity, our sense of patriotism, and our sense of commitment to our country. And our enemy know that. They understand. Based on this understanding, the government of Afghanistan is committed to the restoration of Afghan cultural heritage as an important element of our national narrative in the national building process. While the government is const uh, continuously working on the policy front, the role of academia is key to many solutions in this sector. We hope that this book and the discourse that it supports will help the scholars of humanities to realize this loss and ignore privileges and rights and will help, uh, will help us all understand the importance of the correct attribution of the artifacts to their origin and the rightful owners. With this hope, I stop talking here because everyone in this room would love to hear from Mr. Nawid. Once again, I would like to thank you, Mr. Nawid, for your valuable work, and thank you all for joining us at this discussion. I look forward to have a fruitful discussion. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now I'd like to call upon uh, Mr. Hassan Shazir, the director of the Afghan Academy. Most gracious, most merciful, 
over 40 years of war in Afghanistan. More than a million civilian life was taken. The infrastructure of Afghanistan was destroyed. So many atrocities, human tragedies happened in Afghanistan. And also devastating effect on our artifacts, national artifacts in Afghanistan. During the Soviet occupation from 1979 to 1989, in which time the most civilian fatalities happened. And through the Taliban regime, which went to 2001, so many artifacts were stolen from our museums, from our art galleries, all over Afghanistan, and they were taken to neighboring countries. Also, our historical sites were destroyed, looted, and the objects were generally sold in international black market. Illegal excavations happened all over Afghanistan, unfortunately. And also, the objects found were taken for benefits. Kabul Museum, Hadda, Tapi Maranjan, Bonyan, Baifanem, to name a few. Fortunately, there is hope today in Afghanistan. <coughs> Much is being done to reinstitute art studios, art schools, Archaeology foundations, new archaeological sites are being explored, like the one in Misaignak, Lugar, Kabul, Bamiyan, Bal, and others. And fortunately, we have Mr. Ahmed Nawid today. He is a scholar, a linguist, with a very long resume when it comes to history, art, and civilization in Afghanistan. Through his valuable work and many years of research, including frequent visits to Kabul Museum and important archaeological sites in Afghanistan, as well as visits to major museums in Europe and America, which are housing important artifacts from Afghanistan. He presents the history of civilizations in Afghanistan through his books, his articles, and his lectures. Mr. Ahmed Nawid has a master degree in fine arts from the State University of New York in Buffalo. He was the professor of history at the fine arts department of Kabul University and is now an honorary member of the High Council of Arts and the Center for the Contemporary Art in Afghanistan. Ahmed Namid is also an active member of the Alliance for Res Resurrection, I'm, I'm sorry, Restoration of Cultural Heritage, which is based in Washington, D.C. Art Through the Ages in Afghanistan is written in two volumes by Mr. Ahmed Nawid, and is his major work, one of his major works. I let him tell you more about his priceless publications. Please welcome Mr. Ahmed Nawid. of Afghanistan, Mr. Majid Karar. I'm so glad that everybody's here. I'm not going to 
talk so much to bore everyone, but we have slides which help me start a little bit. <laughs> My granddaughter, also is helping me to change the slides. She's always coming to my lectures. <laughs> well, uh, today we are talking about the other side of Afghanistan. We hear a lot about the war, we hear about terrorism, we have about oh, uh, all sorts of uh, drug dealing, all, all this. But today I try to take you to a journey to see the history of Afghanistan, the beauty of it, its artifacts, and as, uh, the way people thought and how they created this magnificent artwork. And uh, I have to thank Ms. Raya Sadi right there. She helped me so much with putting this last book together and then helped me with the publishing process. She was she worked a lot with me and put up with my bad temper sometimes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but anyway, as uh, Mr. Karar said, you know we are suffering from two um, big uh, negativities about Afghan art and Afghan Afghanistan culture and civilization. One is all these things which happened through the war, you know, by different groups, Taliban, all the destructions which happened. And one is the misinterpretation of the schools of art which flourished in our side throughout the ages. We can, and, and it has been stamped differently than it was supposed to be. So that's why I wrote these two books. That's the main reason I wrote the book the first time in English, because it bothered me when I went to Smithsonian to see something which has been created in Herat has been labeled as Indian art because somebody bought that book from India. It doesn't make any sense. The book was written by Jami, and the illustrations were done by a famous Afghan artist, Beisad. Of course, there was not, the name of the country was not Afghanistan at that time. As many countries around the world, you know, they don't ha have the same name. You know, like Poland was once called Laha, Austria was a different name, had a different name. Bohemia was the name of a big region in Europe. Rome covered a big part of European continent. So Italy cannot claim that everything which happened in France belongs to Italy because once its name was wrong. What happened in the past is not in our hand, you know? But the thing is, we have to respect the countries that exist right now and the cultural heritage according to international law, according to the uh, all, all the standards that we believe in it. Well, anyway, we will go see where is Afghanistan, why this country is uh, important. Can I have next slide, my friend? Okay. See, I believe that Afghanistan was a cultural complex by itself. In Avesta, it's called the land of holy waters, the sacred waters. And Yasht, and also in Vandida, they talk about Anahita, Anahita, who was the guardian of Avan, mean running waters. Where were these running waters? Let's look. These running waters were, can I have the next slide please? Because I don't want, Achis, Oxus. Amurem, Haravita, Hariba, Harirut, Hara Eskati, Arganda, Kobha, the Kabul River and its contributors. That is where most of the, the running waters of, of 
that part of Asia located. You know, like ancient civilizations always emerge next to the waters, like Nile in Egypt, you know, like Mesopotamian civilization between the two big major rivers of Tigris. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, all these waters came them from the mountain, mountain ridge, which part of it called Parapamizad, Parapamizus in Greek, Parapamizad in Aristotle language, Haraparsati is, is part which is starts from Alpers of Bach and goes all the way to Pamir Mountain. And that's where the rivers come and why rivers were important because it provided food part for people. It provided um, also the way to find one location from another location because there were no roads. All the roads were next to the bank of the rivers. That's how people uh, moved and traveled in the ancient days. Didn't have GPS, so these rivers were important. And also it, it created an agricultural uh, culture. Can I have the next slide, maybe? Okay, so we go see, according to uh, archaeological researches, how far back people lived in that land. You know, the, according to the archaeologists and anthropologists of ancient time, of prehistoric period, which was started by the Americans, actually, in Sun in 1950s. Uh, the, we found the evidence of humans living in this country about 100,000 years ago in, in, in Dashtinova of Razni. It, it was near the rock water. And also in the banks of Hillman River all the way to Zalang and also the movements of the human beings going all the way to Badashan, the Homo sapiens 35,000 years ago, and Neanderthals who lived in, in, in the northern plains of Afghanistan. So we have their tools. Can I have? So, and that's the evidence of the, 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 the tools from lower <coughs> Paleolithic period to upper Paleolithic period and then Mesolithic and Neolithic. Can I have the next slide? And that's the most important piece, which, which is housed in Kabul Museum, in the Afghanistan National Museum. It's a small statue of a head of a human being, which was created about 20,000 years ago. Mm. That is the very first statue ever carved in Asia. Louis Dupree of, uh, uh, the Princeton University, wasn't it? He, he was the one who discovered it. And then uh, Alexander Marshak and Cope, they studied it. Then they took these very special pictures to see all the lines, because these lines constitute the fact that it was an artifact. It was not something that just happened. Somebody in a very, very ancient time, and there's a village of Okkuprok of Bach, next to the river of Baal, <coughs> took a hardest stone and carved the face of a creature on a softest stone. So, Rupi called him the, the Michelangelo of the ancient time. Because he was the very first, it was the very first statue carved in the Asia. And then people wonder, what is the Well, anyway, some people thought it's a creature, but it's an anthropomorphic uh, phenomenon, a representation of somebody's ideas. And then uh, maybe it was carried by him and then some uh, religious rituals. But if you can see, you can see a bent knee under the, his lips. That's what makes it very mysterious. And we don't know what's that standing for. And some people think it might be a 
baby which was uh, miscarriage. But we don't know because there's no written record from that time. Can I go to the next one? How, how big is it? This is something which is not stolen from Kabul Museum because everybody thought it's not important, it's just a pebble. But uh, it's, that's why it's there. This is from the time, you know, from Mesolithic time, from, the, from 8,000 BC to 6,000 BC, when agri agrarian civilization, agrarian culture started in the banks of the rivers that I uh, mentioned to, to you, most of them next to Hara Iskati, Kandahar, and Aksus in, 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 in the north. So that comes to the cultural complex that we belong to. And then from west is Har Hariba, and the east is Kabul River Basin. Uh, so, because this same several statues have been found from north and south of Afghanistan, the you know, these little goblets, some of them are decorated with the picture of ibex, and then they have all these animals that they were. You, you, familiar with. I think animal husbandry was started at that time. This little statue you see in, in the very left corner, this one was uh, in, in, in an international market. And now somebody who was very good person with good conscience returned into a farm That piece is about 10,000 years, uh, was created about 10, 10 years 10,000 years ago. And that's the time that they uh, that they discovered how to make pottery because they, the kilns were created, they had fire. And can I have the next slide? And then this is also very ancient. On the left is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's some very symbolic linear shapes which is called kiptogram, they call it, but we don't know what's the meaning of it. It was found from the uh, caves of Samandon, maybe around 12,000 years ago it was created, but it all has a meaning. It is conveying some meanings to the people that they lived at that time, because it has arrows, mm -hmm. it has, uh, you can see, horizontal and vertical lines, you can see shapes like mushrooms. Everything had a meaning that they created, that they drew it on the walls of the cave. Otherwise, why they won't do it? They will do it. It is much, much older than hieroglyph of Egypt. Hieroglyph of Egypt was called the words of gods. You know, it, it was also a pictorial alphabet. But somebody, a French, a French scholar during the time of Napoleon Bonaparte was able to read it. I forgot his name. But nobody has read this, these symbols. Outside of the caves of Samangan, Kazakhstan, if you go, you see the farms. All an <coughs> irrigation system, which is from very, very ancient time, maybe 12,000 BC or 10,000. Uh, the Italian archaeologists were working on it and the Americans and that's why they think that was the first, the very ancient farmland at that time they cultivated wheat and barley. So wheat and barley was, was cultivated in northern plains of Afghanistan much before the Egyptians and Sumerians. So that's why we have the culture and the civilization of the farmers. And that's why our emblem until now is the wheat root because it has some meaning for the people. And then we go to the next slide. <clears throat> During the Bronze Age, uh, as I said, they, they, were, they, they became more mobile because camels, Bactrian camels and horses, that we see their statues. And the other one is a bone seed. The other one is a uh, a statue of a horse maybe used as a weight from Bactria. Horses were very important.
adopted in the ancient cultures, especially in the northern plains of Afghanistan, because very excellent breed of horses were raised there. Very strong, steady horse, horses. And then horses became like a sacred animal. Horses became like a symbol of uh, divinity. That's why the kings of Balkh uh, put the name. The names had two parts. Kai means wisdom. Wisdom. They were people of wisdom and Aspa at the end, end of their name. Like Kis, Kai Kisra, Kai. Gash Taspa, Wish Aspa, La Aspa. The ones which they had the best horses. Because if you had good horses at that time, about 5,000 years ago, you were much uh, stronger than the, the other people who don't have that kind of horses. So they could invade places, they could travel far. So they were proud of horses, their horses. That's why they add the name of their horses at the end of the names, the kings and the warriors did that. Can I have the next slide? And this is when the urban civilization started in Afghanistan, in the bank of Hillman and Arandab River. And also we have some evidences that I couldn't find the pictures, unfortunately, once it was in Afghanistan archive of the ancient uh, walls of, of Balkh, which belonged to that time period. So these two civilizations, these two urban civilizations started in the northern plains of Hindu Kush mountains in southern, and they indeed had a, a relationship because we see the Bactrian camel, camel seed found from Kandahar. So that means that the Bactrian camels travel all the way to Arakuzia, Kandahar today. And then they went all the way to the bank of Helmand River, all the way to Shah Sokhta and the border of Afghanistan and Iran today. And they travel all the way to Somar and Akka and then from there to Egypt. That's the ancient trade route, much, much before uh, the Silk Road. Can I have the next slide? See, that's the ancient trade route, and I found Sun was in the center of these trade routes, because we connected China, borders of China, um, Central Asia to India and vice versa, you know, from India all the way to Herat, from Herat to Tabura, Tabriz, from Tabriz to uh, Asia Minor and banks of, uh, Eastern banks of Mediterranean Ocean. Okay, that's the late, later centuries. Can I have the next slide, please? So, these horses were imported. So where did the name Afghan come from? Why we are Afghans? Some people say Afghans are Pashtuns. But anybody who studied, uh, who has the knowledge of etymology and knows about the roots and stems of the words, they see that Pashtun and Afghan do not correspond. Like Paktos is written in Sanskrit, Pakyans by the Herodotus, Paktos. Paktia province, all start, all, they're all similar. Like once somebody said, Balhika, Bakhta, Bakh, they're all connected, yeah? Uh, when we say Etoman, Hillman, but Afghan and Pashtun, why? So that's why I became very curious to find out myself why, what's this name coming from? That name, according to so many linguists, very credible linguists, like uh, of 19th century, like Christian Lisson of Norway, like uh, Eurytus, France, uh, McCarrandall from England. I don't want to say all the names at the time. It, it means the horseman, the horseman, because the horseman 
horseman uh, is a profession. It's not a tribe. It's, it's, it's anybody can be a horseman. Somebody's a Pashtun, somebody's a Tajik, somebody's a Uzbek, somebody's a Nazara, can be a horseman. A horseman was also a title given Afghana, Avagana, means fighter, to the, the warriors in a Western text. And uh, also in, in the inscription of Shapur II, the Sassanid king, the name Afghan has been written. And then it changed to Afghan, Afghan, changed to Afghan, because the Arabs, when the Arabs came, they did not have pay and gay. And in their language, they call it Afghan. And they divorced to gentlemen, horsemen, cavalry. Uh, anyone can be a good person, a good cavalier. So maybe I am not good, but that's the name of our ancestors. <laughs> That's right. I saw your picture on a horse. I know you did. Yes. So you really are here. So you can go see the ethnonym of Afghan in any dictionary. That's the standard meaning of Afghan. It does not mean Pashtun, Tajik, or Hazara, or anyone. The same way with Ara, Ara, Aryan, Aryana. It does not represent a race. Ara or means plow. Ara means somebody who's plowing. Aran is somebody who's farming. And then it changed to Ariana, the land of the Arabs. Although in the early 20th century, uh, the German scholars and the Iranian scholars were trying to um, find a connection between the kinship of the Europeans and the people who lived in, in the East to show that we are the same race. That was the time that Hitler was, uh, uh, was uh, very adamant in saying that the Aryan race is the best race. It was the same thing was happening in Italy. And then there was a gentleman by name of Joseph Marquardt who, who wrote a book in 19th century and, and then they reprinted his book by the name of Iran Shah. But what he was saying, it was nothing to do about race. They changed it to race. He was saying there's Iranim and in Iranim cities. It means the, the cities that belong to people who were from Iran and cities who belong to the, It was about the soldiers who defected from Rome actually time of Shapur the Sassani. And um, an Armenian guy, his name was Musa Khozani, wrote these cities. That in some of them are some people from Iran, some of them are from Rome. It does not mean that there's a according to an historian who was uh, in the court of Mughals, said Chinggis Khan divided them into 1,000-1,000 troops. That's wrong, because Chinggis Khan did not speak Farsi at all. He was speaking Mongolian. And then, according to Pohan Habibi, Professor Habibi, the biggest historian of Afghanistan, who did lots of research on this world. And when Alexander the Great came to Afghanistan, he talks about his, con his con as a, the, the ones who were with him, the historians who were with him during his campaign wrote that 
near the central Afghanistan, we fought with the people who were called Osalas. And then they changed to Hazra, means somebody who's content and happy. And they put a very gallant war against fight against Alexander forces. And when he comes to Kabul, say, we fought against Afghanas, the horsemen. So we have to know the names of these, uh, roots of these names, you know? And then like Darbik, the people of Bach called the Darbikan. The Darbiks were the people who mm, were, were the forefathers of, of Dari speaking people. So I don't want to go about that. In a civilization, when people live, in a city, all kind of people live in a city. When we start having urban civilization, ethnicities doesn't mean any, anymore according to history, according to what they produce, according to what they remain, left, leave behind. But if you live in a tribalistic mental mind frame, then we think about the ages that we were all living in the different caves and one tribe was different, afraid of the other tribe. That part still is in the back of our mind, but it doesn't mean anything in this world, especially when the communication brings people together every, every hour. Can I have, okay, so that's the statue of the Bactrian horseman, which is in British Museum. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so one of the biggest products of Afghanistan, one of the most important products, one of the ex ex export items, which was very, very lucrative business, was lapis lazuli of our country. The lapis lazuli of Afghanistan and the gold of Afghanistan are, are very important. It is part of the ancient artifacts. For some reason, these stones, the, the lapis lazuli stone, uh, was considered a holy stone because it represented the sky, the heavens, and for, for many uh, civilizations. And also gold was considered a very pure, a very pure uh, thing to have. That's why we have lots of artifacts in gold. So if we see those statues of lepers and the man is carved from gold, this composite statue, because it is from two, two different stones put together. And then you can see the same lapis lazuli in, 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 in the statues of Pharaoh in Egypt and also in Mesopotamia, the harp of, um, what, was the, the, uh, what was the name of the um, queen was, which was so famous, Bilkis. And then over there we see a man <coughs> gilded in gold. That statue is like 5,000 of 400 years ago. That's from Southern Afghanistan. That's in George Ortiz's collection now. George Ortiz is the biggest collector of historical items, you know. He was born in Paris, and then he died in Austria. And then that Pendleton, also from Babylon, carries the same culture of using gem and the gold as, 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 as holy um, elements. And then the people at that time, they were valued. Can I have the next slide, please? So that the way of life was very different, and I think was very, very advanced in Bach. The Princess of Bach, Oxford Server. Can you see how modern her clothes are? This is the composite statue. 
is found from the area of this column. Bactrian Margiana historical site between Bach and Mahan. These statues are found by Victor Sirianardi, um, the famous Russian archaeologist. And then you see again the vessels and the pots and pans that they had in Rome. Rome was very important to them. And then we go to the next slide and see the way of life. See the statues of ladies, Oxus Francis. And then you see the three men sitting on the bench. And these are, these are the mats that they used with very beautiful artwork. And as you see, it's more realistic than an imaginary art in comparison to Indian art, in, in, in Persian art, and Mesopotamian art. They're all human figures, you know? Because if you look at the Mesopotamian art, the head is a person, the body is uh, a, an ox or a lion, then the tail is the, and has wings. These are just normal people like us. So why the art of Afghanistan, 90% of the statues that we see in Afghanistan are very realistic. Very realistic in comparison even to Greek art. Because the Greeks, you have centaurs and setars, you know, half human, half horse. We don't have creatures like that. Because the very ancient Aryans, they believed in, in God, which was beyond people's imagination beyond time, beyond space. They called it Brahman. But as it went to India, these threats uh, immigrated to India, it changed to Brahma, which with, with three different representations, which was Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And they have sub gods. So the imagination of the human being added to it and created more and more gods. So they added more hands, more, more features to it. It was, uh, let's go to the next slide. And this is very important piece. Very, very important piece. It is, uh, can I have some water? This is, uh, this was, was taken to Victoria Albert Museum of London in uh, 1878, or is it 1876, by Q. Nari, who was the British ambassador in Kabul. It was uh, given to Leighton, the Viceroy, and the Viceroy of, of India, given to British. Victoria Albert Museum, mm -hmm. as the biggest collection of the gold is in the British Museum. There was a gentleman by the name of Colonel, Colonel Barton, and then uh, he met a group of merchants on the way from Bath, and they were going to sell the lots of golden items to the, in the markets of Royal Indian Shower. And then on the way, some bandits attacked them, and Colonel Barton went and killed some of the bandits and <coughs> saved the gold. And then later, there were some other people who were in south of Kabul in the cave. He went and killed all of them. Well, he's a savior. He saved all these important golden objects. Then he took it. And <laughs> so, I think practically it belongs to Afghanistan because the last country which was left from was from Afghanistan. Well, at least uh, in British Museum, when you go, it's in the, in, 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 in the room which is for Bab, but it's written on it, a Khamenei art. It doesn't have to do anything with the art of a Khamenei because uh, the inter it was not found by official excavation, no scholarly, if somebody just named it. Because uh, the ones who are familiar with the 
chariots of a how many the Syrians and Egyptians they know that's uh, like like for battles. But this is not for battles. These four horses represent the city of Sariaspa. Sariaspa was this an, another name for Balkh, where Zoroaster was born. And in the city, the golden city of Balkh, nickname was Zariaspa. And there were four horses. Watch one. According to this, huh? one was representing cloud, rain, wind, and thunder. And they carried the chariot of sun because they went to cultivate the farms and everything and then make it ready for the sun to come and bring the spring. That was the dream of the people. That's how Navarroz started because the poem said the chariot of sun rose from the mountain of Harabazati to come and then prosperous, to prosper our lands and then the spring Navarroz will come. It's a very long story. I don't know if I have time because then the, the god of sun, Mitra, falls in love with Anahita in, 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 the, in a hot summer day. And then she becomes pregnant by the sun and then gives birth to second Mitra on the day of Navarroz. The, the oldest, I mean, the longest night that she waits for the sun to come is Yalda. And after that, after March 21st, the days are getting longer, and when it becomes equal, the second mitra, which is now, now goes, is born. Okay, can I go? <laughs> so, now, uh, most of the European scholars, they call it Arab world, Iranian world. They don't go to seek to see how many different subcultures are in this area. All the people who live on the other side of Tigris River are not Arabs. There were so many different ethnicities. There were so many different subcultures. There are Palestinians, there are Jordanians, there are Iraqis, there are Sumerians, there are uh, people of Jerusalem, there are people from Egypt. Morocco, Tunisia, they all have their own culture. The land, they speak the language Arabic is correct, but the language does not establish somebody's identity. I'm speaking English right now, and it doesn't make me an, an Englishman. So they make this division on the basis of language, but language is a learned phenomenon. You can learn any language from any tribe you are. And then they call it the Iranian world. But all the people who live in that area, according to what they think Aryanism, do not have the same race of Aryans. They are Uzbeks, they are Tartarians, they are Turkmans, they are all kinds of people live there. So why you call it the Iranian world? That's why what my uh, argument was with the Library of Congress. Do not make different divisions. Every country has its own uh, characteristics, their own ideas. Like our music, local music, authentic Afghan local music, is very different than Iranian music, local music. Our classical music is different. If we say that the language is important, you know, I have seen a wrote this major books in, in Arabic, so that, that's why they do not have it. This is something which has created so much confusion, especially for the scholars of, of new generation of scholars from America, England, all over, because they don't want to stand against what the ancient, old scholars said. They don't have the guts. But since nobody is giving me any grant, <laughs> I can say whatever I want to say, <laughs> but I say it on the basis of, of reason. <clears throat> no, that's why I didn't want my book to be reviewed 
by the scholars because then they have their formulas. The formulas of art is different than, person, than perceptions of some people that was established in 19th century, early 20th century, you know? Well, let's go. See, as we can see here, there are two cultural zones, geographical zone. One is next to Mesopotamia, the two rivers, and then you see a big desert in between. Over there is the, Ak the Zaktos Mountains, and then the Elamite Kingdom, which Persian culture was based upon it. And over here we have the high plateau of Parokamizus or Parokamizal, and the other side is Harabazeti, which goes all the way to China. And then most of the rivers that I talked about belongs to that area. Then the big desert and the Persian Gulf. And then the Persian plateau does not, is not part of the Iranian plateau. The Iranian plateau is, is different than Persian plateau. The Persian plateau is, is the same with Iraq in Saudi Arabia. See, Armenian plateau is very high. Then you come to Zagros Mountains. Then you, the, the way, the place that is called Iran, actually, by Kadavsi, is, is that area. Okay, let's go to the next slide, because I don't want to. And then, if we study uh, Avesta, it's about they talk about 16 cities that, that was called the first, the Holy Land of Avissa, the first Holy Land of Avissa, where the, the idea of Zoroaster went there, was accepted there. Out of those 16 cities, 12 of them are in Afghanistan. So all, all the names are there. Can I go have the next slide, my dear? And then, see, we have to differentiate between fable and history. Histro historiography started with Herodotus and, and, and the rest of the Greek historians. The, the difference is that a historian writes something um, with the name, with the time, and the place. But in fable, you're free. So that's why Shahnama cannot be a complete historical text, because a fable. He talks, first of all, Shahnama was written 1,000 years after Zoroastrian mm, culture was at its peak. 1,000 years he wrote it. He, he collected information from different places. He says, Feragun uh, ruled for 700 years. That's not possible. He, he doesn't like the he says he, he only ruled 12 years. And then uh, the, the king Kumas, 800 years. And, and Buras, uh, Zahak, 1,000 years. And then he said, Freydun has three sons. Uh, Iraj, Turaj, and Salam. Iraj became the king of Iran, Turaj became the king of Turan, and Salam became the king of Rome. No, no there's no emperor by the name of Salam in Rome. <coughs> so it's all fable, it's a story, it's a beautiful story, but you cannot base the whole history of a nation upon it. We have to have evidences. And this is the very first uh, map which was drawn by Aristotelus of Greece. He was the first geographer. And he, you can see where he has marked Haryana, India, Arabia, Persis, Persia. And in the rest of the world. Okay, we're done. <laughs> All right, then we go to next next.
display. And that's why the art is different. See, the, the very first one is, uh, is, is a Persian art. Then the next two is, is Mesopotamian. They're almost identical. Mm -hmm. And the other one from Bath is very realistic. Can I have the next slide? And then Alexander came. He came uh, in fourth century BC. He, he defeated Darius and then incitement to Afghanistan. And then he was uh, having a hard time by Tassus. Some people, sons, and Stanka uh, uh, managed the leaders of Afghanistan who fought against him. And then he fought for five years, exhausted. Then he wrote to a letter, and then letter to his mother. He said, Why are you involved in such a difficult war? Where are you? He said, you, I'm involved in a country that people are like walls in front of me. You raised one Alexander, but every mother in this country has raised an Alexander. <laughs> and then uh, later on, he <coughs> went up with Roxana, Roxana of Bactria. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was actually the marriage of two cultures, which, which created the beautiful Hellenistic art of Bactria, called greco bactrian art. So we go to the next slide. And then these are the kings of Bactria uh, that they lived for three centuries there. So they were all, uh, they, they didn't consider themselves Greeks anymore, except their names. And then they created this beautiful artwork, uh, which was a combination of ancient Ardiana and art of, of, of Greece. It was, uh, that's why I call Hellenistic art. Hellenistic is, you know, after the classical period of Pericles. Let's go. So we can see there are two big centers at that time. One was Bagram, Kapisa, and the other one was Bach. And we can see, see the, the very last one is, is, uh, is a medallion of Aras, the Greek war. Uh, God of War. It has lots of Greek features because it was created at, under the influence of Hellenistic art. And then next to it is the warrior of Saka. Saka's tribes were the forefathers of the people of Sistan. They believed in Sistana. Sistana means God. Sakistan, Sistana. It's still in Pashto, we, we call it Sistan means God. And then uh, he is so different than the Greek statue. His, his uh, features, the way he carries himself is very realistic. He's not over exaggerated. And the other one is also from Begram. Uh, it is um, the statue of Aphrodites, who bribes Hercules to give a uh, this golden apple to the judge and then she becomes the, the most beautiful princess beautiful lady of the world she did the bribing according to Greek and this uh, statue was uh, created in Bagram but next to it is the statue of Atenas which was created by the later centuries with the influence of the local people and it's all dressed up See, because in Greek, Greek statues were all naked because they wanted to show the beautiful body of the gods and goddesses. And then the same goddess is created with clothes. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is the city of Icono in northern Afghanistan. How much time do I have? Um, should, should I stop? <laughs> <laughs> And then, unfortunately, this two Okay, but these are more important than my books. Of course. <laughs> Afghanistan is more important yeah. than anything. Yeah. yeah. Our civilization, you know? 
Okay, and these are the palace of Eichhorn between the Kokcha and Oxus River. Can you have the next slide, please? And these are the beautiful artifacts which are left from Eichhorn, the Bacterian man. And then there's the plate uh, of Sibo. And these two objects which are there, they are the most amazing things. One is uh, the sundial that you could calculate the year. And it's, um, it was uh, positioned uh, between 37 degrees and 38, 39 degrees, whereupon the sun is located in the northern hemisphere. hemisphere. And it has uh, a little uh, metal that you can tell which time of the year it is. And the second one, the lower, uh, the one on the, on the very far right is, is a watch, is a, is a clock, uh, which is uh, um, the most complicated one. It sees the, the sunshine from two sides to calculate the time, and it is uh, positioned uh, as a, at, at the angle of a quarter to tell the time of, of India. Amazing, amazing discovery. Okay, let's go. Oh, I'm sorry. What year was where they Second got century it? and third century AD, BCE. BCE. Yeah. And these are just these beautiful artifacts that you all saw from Shivan, the golden uh, tradition that I spoke about. It was something gold, but something holy for them. That's why they were creating all these important jewelries. But all these jewelries had a story to tell. It's not just a jewelry. Like these two is the statue of Oros, uh, Cupid. And they, they, you can see them there. The other one is this, is about this fable of our um, Dionysus in Aviadin and how they find the love and overcome this uh, monster, monstrous creature which represents um, mentor in, in, in Greek mythology. But this one is different. It's the creation of the artist who lived in Chaparral. Nothing to do, no similarity between this uh, creation and Greeks. So it has its own characteristics. So let's go to the next one. And these are all these beautiful items from the Golden Heart of Chevron, which is one of the most, um, most valuable uh, collection around the world after the Egyptian Golden Heart of Tutankhamun, the Pharaoh. You can go to the next slide. And this is from Southern Afghanistan, from uh, got this from Musaka. Unfortunately, 1992, Musaka was looted, and most of it is beautiful items were taken to bazaars of Peshawar and sold. Among them, uh, Musaka was, was uh, this, there was a, a, like an old building called Kofakala. It had a big pool. pool. And then every king and every queen and every important person was throwing a piece of jewelry there uh, as a contribution to God, a tribute to God. And then it became full with water and it brought it to the surface and some people found it. And then uh, until 1992, it was safeguarded by the Kaaba Afghan government. And after that, it was looted. Among them is the most important uh, golden medallion, golden emblem of Alexander with the, the helmet of, of an elephant after he conquered India. Can I go next one? And these are most beautiful uh, glassware that we Some of them have Roman motifs in it, and some of them are local design. The one which I have. Um, Roman motifs is, is a puzzle. 
because how this fragile glassware came all the way from Rome to Afghanistan over the mountains on the back of camel and mules. So that surprises everyone. And then how come it was not broken? So the theory is that maybe some artists came from uh, that uh, region and started this kind of uh, glassware in Afghanistan because in Messinac we found lots and lots of pieces of, of, of belted glass that they had used, used it at the ancient time. Can I have the next slide because we're running out of time? And this is the ivory collection of Afghanistan because uh, it's very important because Afghanistan has a dry climate and it is preserved. In India it was not preserved. In Egypt it is not preserved. We go next slide. Because uh, I am not going to tell the story. It's so beautiful, this story. But, uh, <laughs> huh? Foundation? Yeah. We are very much interested in the book. Okay, okay. We can read the story in the books. We can go to the next one. Oh, Bach. Bach was the creator of Greek or Bach, Buddhist art, according to Fouché. Because uh, um, Bach, we had uh, very ancient temples of Bud Buddhist temples. The brothers Tapuso and Barhika were the first people who went to see Buddha in the eighth week after Buddha became Buddha. So they brought the, the, uh, the hair of Buddha in Bach. Can we go next slide, please? That then made it created this artwork. The second thing is. <clears throat> we urge, I urge, from all international collectors of uh, historical items to stop buying the artifacts from smuggled from Afghanistan. Because at least, until these days, until there's a customer, people still see it. And then if they have, they can return it to Afghanistan. And the third thing is, I ask all international friends to help us with safeguarding our historic sites, helping Kabul Museum to be restored further in uh, Afghan National Art Gallery. That's all our request is. Thank you. Actually, there's three different ministries of Afghanistan that can come to a decision. Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Mining, and Ministry of Culture. As far as I know, when I went to Ms. Hainak, some statues were saved and some of them were restored in, 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 in a storage room, so not like the pieces of Bamiyan were restored. There's a lot to talk about this thing. Uh, right now, this uh, contract is not in effect, but in future, if it might be, there are two kinds of mining, as far as I know. One's called the strip mining, when they explode the top of the mountain and increase disaster. And one when you dug tunnels, and, and then you can excavate the copper or anything without damaging the environment. I get carried away when okay. I see those um, artworks. Uh, there's yeah. one Katiba that was. Yes, one that's of, very that important. That is something that a few there are two, two about inscriptions which are very important, yeah. which is uh, Sotkotan and Rabatak. Because it shows um, that where our language came from. In Katiba yeah. of Sotkotan, it was written in Greek alphabet 
But when Shilom Berger, the French archaeologist, went to read it, he couldn't understand the meaning of it. So that's why he asked the Afghan scholars to come and help him. Like the word Naisan means Bahar, is, is, is their spring. And uh, Oba, Abu, Abu. Abu in, means Allah and Dadi, Oba in Pashto. Zamata, Zamata. Zamin in Pashto, Zimaka, Abbas, Dali, Zamin in Pashto, that uh, Atar or Atash, like uh, Achicht, Achicht, is, is Chicht, and Chicht in Pashto, Cha, Cha, is well, Brick, I mean it's Chicht, I'm sorry, I thought, you know, Cha, with, without He, is, is well. Water. All these words uh, show the origin of these languages which exist in Afghanistan. It's called the Dahari Tahar, Dahari language of Kushanir, according to the uh, Chinese uh, uh, evidences. But in Rabotak, um, inscription which was found later. It is, in the first line it says that I s s announced my kingdom, Kanishka says, the first year of Arya, Ara, Arya. And then it says uh, the discontinuation of Ionic language, and it's called Ionic means Greek Ion. And, uh, and, and usage of Ari language which is Ari changed to Dari. And in, in Persia, we have inscriptions of Cyrus in there is inscription of Cyrus. He calls himself the king of Akkad, Somer, and Babylon. He does not call himself the king of Iran. He does not call upon Zoroaster. He says he believes in Marduk, Marduk, which is the king of Babylon. And then in, in the second inscription they have, they have some words of Parsi, which is Parsik, which is Old Persian. And then about 25% of that inscription, the rest of it is in, in Babylonian language, Akkadi language. And then he traces himself to Vishtas, king of Bach. So, now the fight over Farsi in Pashto, the fight over Dari in Persian is, is very trivial. Very trivial because they're all Indo-European languages. They come from one root, from one family of languages. Like in the in Indo-European languages, the word mother is starts with M. But in Sumerian, Semitic languages, it starts with O, um, Om. And Father it starts with Pe or Fe, Pashto, Plar, Pada, and Dari, Mor, Mother, Hor, Har, Sister. It has an R at the end. But in, in, in Arabic, it's Och, totally different. So that's why this language is which is from Sanskrit all the way to uh, Pahlavi, Ashkani, uh, is, uh, has the same root. And then when, when it gets close to Parsik, it has a different root, which was built on Elamid, on Elamid language of uh, pre achamanid era. Sorry, I don't want to talk about it too much. <laughs> Yes. And you saw the chariots. Yes. That was mislabeled. Uh, yes. Khamenei. Yeah. Uh, we all know that uh, economic strength uh, plays a big role. Exactly. In pervading your branding and your culture. Uh, a great example of that, and I read this, but maybe you know more about it. Uh, there's a debate about 
Yehudi, yes. being Iranian and Turkish. Yeah. There's no reference that he was really actually born in Afghanistan as a full-fledged Afghan scholar. And I read somewhere that the UN, uh, thanks to the uh, efforts of the Afghan yeah. government, yeah. this gentleman in front of you, recognized the most of the world. Didn't know that. They were able to recognize Rumi as, as a national heritage for three countries instead of it, it, it included Afghanistan. So some people are making efforts to that effect to make these corrections. When you were in London, did you take any personal steps to inform yes, the uh, museum uh, authorities? Uh, yes, I went to talk with the British Museum curator who was um, um, a very important man. He said that Iran has lots, makes lots of contribution, and then also the Afghan government has to talk with them because I'm not an official person. Long time ago, and then um, you know, um, Professor Pinder Wilson at that time was in Kabul, and uh, he was the representative of British Museum, and then he was doing research on Asmi art. And I told him, he said, uh, at that time, the golden horde, horde of, uh, of uh, uh, Shabir Khan was created. He said, yes, I can see the trace of the gold, golden objects in Afghanistan. I will definitely take that as a consideration. But the coup of 1978 happened, and then uh, it, it, it stopped. And President Dawood, late President Dawood, was very adamant about uh, but everything changed, and then after that, we, we were involved in wars and wars and wars. And I'm going to go to London on March 21st, on uh, March, no, January, and I will have this, this again. And then at least if they don't want to return it to Afghanistan, at least they should label it correctly. That's right. And, and get the right credit to the people. Thank you very much, uh, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. And thank you for your attention. Uh, a lot of people were following us on social media throughout that uh, streaming. So, uh, <laughs> and then as well. Oh, uh, Sure. Yeah, but the video will remain there, and it will be. I, I'm sure that uh, so many people will use it as an academic oh reference, um, and we will promote it. Um, All right. okay. So there are ways uh, of promoting this. We are behind this uh, discourse, as I said. This is an important discussion for us. The embassy has been trying very hard to, uh, especially in the United States, to convince the government of the United States to help us with this, and we luckily have. Um, started an MOU with the government of the United States um, to um, help us, to the, the U.S. government to help us um, return the things that are uh, being seized by the police here. Uh, there are three artifacts currently that are um, in process that we have asserted them as the belonging to Afghanistan and we hope that we will be able to return it. And also on the academic front, we will continue uh, with this discussion in the future. Thank you very much for, for sure, your thank you. Well, I thank uh, you and the Embassy of Afghanistan, Mr. Khalar, and all the staff for uh, hosting this uh, meeting. And uh, I'm sorry if I took so much time, but these artifacts are so complex and involved that it cannot be uh, described in one uh, session. Every one of them has a lot of value and a lot of story to talk about. Only the art of Hada is so rich. The same way the art of Aikhanam is very rich that I s skipped over it. At the same time, uh, the one thing that I want to say is very important that the paintings of Kamaluddin Beyzad, uh, his master, his teacher, Mirak, Ruhullah Mirak Hirabi, and then Musa Musaver, and Maulana Waliullah Wali, they were like the greatest artists like Michelangelo 
and Leonardo da Vinci of the West, and they all were born and raised in Herat, and they created their work in Herat, and they established the school of painting, which is called the School of Herat. But unfortunately, all the paintings are labeled as Persian art, very generically in all galleries of the Western world, because I don't know if it's laziness or overlooking yes. at Afghanistan, but uh, of course, there are beautiful artwork in Iran too, like School of Tabriz and Isfahan, and I respect that. There are so many beautiful artwork in India and uh, pictorial art, which is like very close to the art work of Bezatian school, uh, like School of Agra and Delhi, Lahore. It's beautiful, same, the same thing. Samarkand has lots of beautiful work, and it's not created in Persia. This art came from uh, Chinese Turkestan, actually, to Mesopotamia, and during the Timurid era, it, it, it was encouraged by Sharaf Mirza and his son, by Samar, that all, all these artists should come and create their work. And then later, when Ismail Safavi invaded Herat in 1510, they took, he took Bezal with him to Tabriz. That does not make him a Persian. He was very, actually, he was very depressed at that time that the most of his work was done by his pupils that he trained in, uh, trained in Tabriz. Only one or two paintings he did. And then he came at the end, end of their uh, life and, and his life back to uh, Herat, and he died in his uh, burials in Koi Mukhtar in Herat. And I have urged, I'm going to urge the Afghan government to fix his grave because once we went there and we tried our best, and papers are going on. This going on. We went there. I'm not sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you, because that guy is. At is, that time, yeah, we, we as a delegation went there. You went to Koi Mahtar, yeah. and then you built the building. It's okay. going on. Thank the you. The U.S. is also Thank supporting you. the project. So U.S. Is, okay, yeah. good. About I Amir mean, Abishir and Nawai. That's Nawai. also under construction, or might be, I mean, open nowadays. And Sultan was signed by Karan. Thank you. 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 Thank you.